Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Brad Mussel and welcome to lecture 9 of Logic and Critical Thinking. In this lecture we turn our attention to the concept of rhetoric, uh, something we definitely want to be uh, aware of as critical thinkers. So in this third section of the course, so we're nearing the end, this ninth lecture here will end the third section of the course and so um, starting with the next lecture, lecture 10 through then lecture 12, that'll be the final fourth section of the course. But in this third section of the course, we have taken a look at various sort of issues that the critical thinker needs to be aware of, right? We've set aside our specific focus on arguments that we had in section two, and we started talking about, again, these kind of related issues um, that aren't argument specific, but things that we need to be on guard against or be aware of as critical thinkers. So, for example, in lecture seven, we discussed issues with respect to clarity, uh, how we can avoid being unclear right issues with respect to ambiguity vagueness and so on in lecture eight we talked about issues with respect to credibility when we should sort of as claim filters right as critical thinkers were claim filters and when we should sort of throw up the flag and be especially on guard against certain claims or certain sources of the claims right what's being said um, when we should be suspicious right or at least more suspicious than we otherwise would be uh, in general again issues with with respect to credibility and so in this particular lecture, then we, in the final lecture of section three, we turn our attention to this idea of rhetoric. Uh, and uh, it will obviously flesh this out in uh, more detail, especially at the beginning of the lecture here. Um, but as we'll see, it's, it's something that arguably is, you know, one of the number one things we need to be on guard against as critical thinkers. Because remember, as critical thinkers, we're concerned with the information that's conveyed and whether, you know, in some sense it's true or false. Okay, so uh, we want to solicit or extract the information in and of itself, unpackage that as best we can, at least when we're critical thinkers or have that as our job, right? We want to unpack that, the information itself, the arguments itself, unpack it from all the other extra baggage, this emotional baggage, right? And that's what we mean to suggest by this idea of rhetoric, right? It's the... Um, the emotional, the extra stuff uh, that tends to, as the authors did a good job pointing out, tends to oftentimes be even more persuasive than the information or the arguments themselves. Um, so as critical thinkers, since especially since that's the case, right, this other stuff, right, that shouldn't even matter from a critical thinker's perspective, since it is uh, in some sense uh, so much more persuasive, that is, again, another reason why we need to be especially on guard against it. Okay, so again, we'll um, we'll flesh out again why it is we need to um, be wary of rhetoric, uh, especially in the beginning of the lecture, but that's what's on tap. So again, in this lecture, we're uh, concluding section three, and so then in the next lecture, lecture 10, we'll begin section four, uh, where we will talk all about then fallacies. I'll say a little bit more about that at the end of this lecture, right? We'll preview um, in section four, but Let's go ahead and begin lecture nine itself. Before I do, I wanted to mention, as I do on the course schedule, if you're taking the course, that you don't have to worry about the last section. So lecture nine here, rhetoric, right? It corresponds, if you're taking the course, to chapter five of the textbook. Okay, so in this 13th edition, uh, somewhere in between the 10th and the 13th edition, they added this extra stuff on demagoguery, and you don't have to worry about it, as I mentioned in the schedule, right? So demagogues, we're going to set the, them aside and issues with respect to them. So you, again, as I mentioned in the schedule, you don't have to read pages 162 to 166 of the textbook. You're not responsible for that stuff. Okay, so I wanted to mention that at the outset. But let's go ahead then and begin uh, lecture nine here. So let's try to spell out in a little bit more detail what exactly this idea of rhetoric is. I, I alluded to it, obviously, and I, I mentioned that it has something to do with the extra stuff that as critical thinkers, right, we want to set aside and um, not be unduly influenced by, but let's try to, to spell that out a little bit more. Okay? So um, this is a slide two of the lecture notes then. As I mentioned, this is from page 146 of the 10th edition. The following is especially telling, as they say in the 10th edition. Well, what we have to say may be important, but the words we choose to say it with can be equally important. Okay? And that's what we're going to really learn uh, as we proceed in this this lecture, right? Is that um, just by tweaking the way we say things, it can become much more or much less persuasive, even though underneath it, what's logically being said is exactly the same, 
right? And that's, again, speaks to the power of our emotions and our feelings and then the words that are used to sort of spark those feelings and emotions, right? And why we have to, as critical thinkers, be very wary of this kind of rhetorical use of our language, right? To get us to um, be persuaded in certain ways. So second bullet point, the, I guess this is a quote from page 142 of our 13th edition. So we're, we're gonna, going to kind of um, be referencing this distinction here, right? So it's one thing to speak of, right, the rhetorical force, I mentioned this distinction over here, and real rhetoric or persuasion on the one hand, and then it's another thing to talk about the logical force of what's being said, or logic, being concerned with the logic and argumentation of what's being said. So these are two, as the authors did a good job of, um, you know, spelling out, these are two separate affairs. And in fact, right, they, they did a great job of spelling out how when this is your end goal, persuasion, persuading people of stuff, oftentimes this is the least effective, right? Or at least it's not as effective as other means. For example, as we'll get into some of these. So these are why these are so often used, right? Because people are concerned with this, right? And since this doesn't oftentimes work as well as some of these, well, then that's why these are oftentimes used, right? Repetition, for example, just saying whatever you want someone to think or believe over and over and over, as weird as it sounds, um, this has been demonstrated to work over time, right? And it's, that's more effective than trying to convince them with a good argument oftentimes. So again, the second then bullet point down, it's a quote from page 142. This speaks to sort of this differentiation that we're getting into here. So as I mentioned, the rhetorical force or emotive meaning of words and expressions refers to, quote, their power to express and elicit various psychological and emotional responses. So again, we need to be on guard against the rhetorical force of language and the emotive meaning of certain words. So certain words have the power to conjure up, you know, either very positive or very negative emotions, right? And then that's going to then speak to the effect of their ability to persuade us, right? Oftentimes unduly, maybe the arguments that are lying underneath aren't any good, right? But given how it was voiced or couched, we were persuaded nonetheless. Again, that's what we want to um, work hard to avoid, okay? those sort of sorts of situations as critical thinkers. Then, as I mentioned at the very bottom of slide two, rhetoric itself, quote, refers to the study of persuasive writing. Okay? Again, it's all about persuading people. Okay? And it's used in a broad sense to reflect several techniques or devices, which we'll get into here, which are sometimes referred to as slanters, as I mentioned there. Okay? And these are employed in an effort to make claims and arguments come across as more convincing than they otherwise you know, would or should. Okay. okay, turning to slide three then. This is a quote from 143. In the end, remember that rhetoric, quote, may be psychologically compelling, but by itself it establishes nothing. If we allow our attitudes and beliefs to be formed solely by the rhetorical force of words, we fall short as critical thinkers. And that's the theme I've been trying to hammer home up to this point, right? That's one of our chief tasks. And that's the theme of this, this lecture, if you will, right? We have to be on guard against the power of rhetoric okay, in general. So do have this kind of distinction in the back of your mind, you know, as we proceed uh, and in general as critical thinkers, right? You always want to be on guard against the rhetorical force of what's being said, right? As critical thinkers, you want to extract the logic or the arguments that are at play, right? And remove as much of that emotional baggage as you can. Um, so be, as I mentioned in the middle of slide three, be familiar with this kind of distinction, okay? But what we wanna focus on is this. And so in the process, right, we want to be able to recognize all these kinds of rhetorical devices or slanters, which aren't in, them, in and of themselves mistakes. That's, that'll be another thing that we try to flesh out here. There's nothing particularly wrong with them, you know, per se, but, right, so they don't necessarily mean it's a, there's a bad argument here, right? The point is, though, that they don't have any bearing one way or another, right? And the problem is oftentimes they'll still still be persuasive nonetheless, even though they shouldn't, right? They shouldn't. They shouldn't convince us one way or another, positively or negatively, right, given what's being said in terms of the arguments or the logic. They nevertheless oftentimes do, okay? And that's, again, why we want to be able to recognize these and set them aside for what they are. Um, uh, I guess that's more or less, the again, the point that I was mentioning then 
the second from the bottom. Just because you see one of these doesn't mean that, hey, you have a bad argument, right? You just want to be familiar with them and recognize that oftentimes they are employed because they are so good at persuasion, right? Um, it might make an otherwise bad argument turn out to be rather persuasive, okay? And that's why, again, we want to be on, bar on guard against them. But as I'm mentioning in the third bullet point down on slide three, just because you see one of these doesn't mean, hey, bad argument. You still have to go in and analyze what's being said from a logical perspective or the arguments that are there. You have to still have to analyze them for what they are, right? one way or another, whether these are here or not. Right? Okay, so that's what I have in, in terms of, you might say, introductory notes. Let's go ahead then. All we're really going to do, going to do from this point forward is we have kind of a catalog, which I've tried to... I think I've got everything we're going to talk about up here, actually. And so, you know, these are just, just a catalog of very common rhetorical devices or slanters, much like we'll do in the section, uh, fourth section of the course where we go through, you know, a, a long catalog of fallacies or mistakes in reasoning. We're going to do pretty much the same thing here. Now, again, the difference between these and then what we'll get, to, get into in this uh, fourth section of the course is that, again, there's nothing necessarily or inherently from a logician's perspective, problematic about any of these. Um, well, they're problematic in the sense that they can unduly persuade us oftentimes, right? So don't get me wrong there, but they don't indicate a mistake per se, right? Just because somebody uses a you know euphemism doesn't mean that they've committed a mistake. Well, that is the case when we get to the fallacies in section four, there are you know, mistakes being made, okay? That's the difference here. There aren't necessarily logical mistakes being made Right, but again, we just want to be able to recognize these and make sure we're not being unduly persuaded, persuaded nonetheless. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through this catalog here of these common rhetorical devices or slanters. It's kind of outlining what they are, giving some examples, um, so that hopefully you know you in turn can be able to recognize them and identify them, and again, not dismiss whatever is being said from a logical perspective, right? But be especially on guard. Right, and be be ready then to kind of set aside whatever emotions were drawn up by these slanters or these devices, and be able to actually just analyze this stuff in and of itself. So, without further ado, slide four, we get into euphemisms. So, you might have heard of this term that a euphemism is, as I mentioned in the the very top there, from uh, page one forty three of our text. It's a, quote, neutral or positive expression used in place of one that carries negative associations. Okay, so we're, the idea is we're using a word or phrase that conjures up positive feelings or emotions. All right, we're using that word or phrase in lieu of, you know, a word or phrase that would be more neutral or negative. Right, so we want to, again, the, the person employing a euphemism is trying to, to make things rosier or better than they might otherwise appear. So you oftentimes see pre-owned cars, right? Uh, advertisements for pre-owned cars rather than used car because pre-owned sounds slightly better, right? It doesn't conjure up the kind of negative imagery that a used car might, right? So that's why we see, especially in advertising, lots of euphemisms, right? Such as pre-owned cars. And then another example I give there at the bottom of the slide four is detainees instead of prisoners. Right, detainees doesn't sound quite as bad as prisoners. Right? So oftentimes governments right, or whoever has these detainees might refer to them as detainees instead of prisoners because again, it sounds at least slightly better. Okay, turning to slide five, we have the opposite thing. So we talk about euphemism here. Dysphemism, it just does the same thing, but in the opposite direction, right? So you if you're employing a dysphemism or whoever is employing a dysphemism, generally, right, they want to render what's being said, right? They want to conjure up more negative emotions um, and a, a more negative, they want to put a more negative spin on it than what might otherwise have been conveyed if they've used more neutral or positive language. Right? So uh, again, from page 143 of the text, these are used to, quote, produce a negative effect on someone's attitude about something or to tone down the positive associations it may have. So one of my favorites, idiot box instead of television set, and I do use that one as often as I can. Cancer sticks instead of cigarettes. So back when I was young, cigarettes were a lot more common, and I do remember 
um, when some people started referring to them as cancer sticks. Uh, so those are uh, just a couple of examples of dysphemisms. Again, a uh, word or phrase that couches something in a, a more negative way so that whoever's reading it right, or hearing it, um, it's conjuring up more negative emotions for them. All right, so that was dysphemism or dysphemisms. Next in our catalog, we have what are known as Weaslers. And I'll start just with the quote at the top. So this is from page 144 of our text. It's on the top of slide six of the lecture notes. Quote, Weaslers help protect it, that is a claim, from criticism by watering it down somewhat, weakening it, and giving the, uh, the claim's author a way out in case the claim is challenged. So in a sense, then, the next quote, this is from the 10th edition, page 149, Weaslers are, quote, Linguistic methods of hedging a bet, end quote. So the idea here is with the Weaslers, it's way, it's a, provide someone with a way of saying something and kind of conveying something uh, that's a lot stronger oftentimes than what they are comfortable actually defending, right? But they couch it in such a way that um, they didn't technically, they don't technically actually commit themselves to the stronger, you know, thing that's, suggested right it's just being suggested right? and so that's where it becomes powerful right because what's actually being suggested isn't what they're literally right um committed to given the way it's phrased okay so some examples might make this what's clear but you know it's very powerful because again it lets people say things and get away with saying things uh that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to just because they kind of throw in these qualifiers right or they hedge what they're saying by throwing in these qualifying phrases or words, right? Which let them kind of get out of, technically speaking, right? Get out of the much stronger claim that's still being suggested, right? But they're not technically committed to. So something, an example here in a little bit will we'll make, make this hopefully a little clearer. So there, as I mentioned in the middle there on slide six, Weasler's, Weaslers are using an effort to avoid unwanted consequences with voicing a claim in a stronger language. So some very common Weasler words or phrases, perhaps, right? You throw perhaps in there and you could say basically anything you want, right? Because you're not saying it's the case. You just said perhaps, right? Or maybe same thing, possibly same thing there. It seems that sometimes you say any of this stuff before whatever it is you're saying and it gives you a way out, right? Because you haven't actually committed to saying it. You're just saying it, it's possible, right? Or perhaps the case, or it seems that, or sometimes it might be the case, right? Um, if you qualify or qualify whatever it is you're saying by preceding it with that or, uh, yeah, you know, qualifying by saying something like this, then again, you are able to convey and insinuate something that's much stronger than what you're actually literally saying. Um, so I'll give you an example at the very bottom. Quote, Brad may be the dumbest person I've ever met. That, end quote, that's just my own example there, right? So by saying maybe, right? You, you're suggesting, hey, Brad's pretty dumb, but technically you don't say that he's dumb or, you know, you're suggesting he might be the dumbest person. And that makes the person think, well, all right, then Brad must be dumb, but really you haven't even said he's dumb at all, right? You've just said he may be the dumbest person I've ever met. Of course, he might be the smartest, given what you said, right? That still might be the case, okay? So, again, the way we couch things is very powerful, and, and uh, that's why Weezers are so common, Right? Because you can, you can throw in maybe, or perhaps, or possibly, and you can get away with saying practically anything. Right? So that was slide six. Moving on to slide seven. Weasler is also very common in advertising. Okay? What's, what are the, which of these is not common in advertising? We see almost all of these in advertising. Again, because their goal is to persuade us one way or another. Right? Uh, so they gave a really good example back in the ninth edition, which I highlight at the top of slide seven. So this was from pages 154 to 155 of the ninth edition. In that edition, they, they say, quote, so they give this as an example. Three out of four dentists surveyed recommend sugarless gum for their patients who chew gum, end quote. So look, on the face of it, right, if we don't have our critical thinking uh, cap on and we're just going through life 100 miles an hour like we typically are, this might be end up being much more persuasive than it really should be, right? Um, because there's actually a few Weaslers in here, right, which should really make us pause and question what we should take out of this, if anything at all, 
right? So first of all, you know, those surveyed, okay? Three out of four dentists surveyed. Well, how many were surveyed, right? Was it four, okay? And if the four of your best friends, whoever this advertiser is, right? You know, how many were surveyed? That is a kind of Weasler because you are able to imply, right? That it's a much stronger case than maybe it really is. Okay? And then as I mentioned at the very bottom here, of course, right, another kind of Weasler is at the very end, how they tack on for their patients who choose or chew gum. As I mentioned at the very bottom, of course, they're going to prefer or recommend sugarless gum when the only alternative is non-sugarless gum. Right? So again, these kind of Weaslers slip in all the time, especially in advertising. And so we want to be on guard against them and be able to recognize them when they're there. Another very common uh, rhetorical device then is what's known as a down player. Okay, so as I mentioned at the uh, top of slide eight, this is from page 44 of the 13th edition, quote, down players attempt to make someone or something look less important or less significant. Okay, so, you know, growing, I just imagine kids always, you know, employing down players, right? Um, as, you know, part of excuses, right? Whenever you get an excuse about something, there's usually a down player involved, right? So there's, yeah, 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 this happened, but, right? The but is downplaying whatever it was that happened, right? So anytime you get like an excuse, oftentimes there's a down player involved, right? Okay? Um, just like we have common word or phrases involved with Weasler, so too we have them with, when it comes to down players, right? When you hear mere or merely or so-called or although or nevertheless, nonetheless, however, but, as I mentioned a moment ago, that's a very common one. These are all very oftentimes indicative of down players, right? The person who's employing them is trying to minimize something that's being said or the, or something that's at play, right? Yes, this happened, but right, we shouldn't um, worry about it too much because yada, yada, yada. Right? So I'll give you an example, a couple of examples actually at the bottom of slide eight. Well, although Ramirez is hitless in his last 183 at bats, holy moly, you've got to remember that he's a pitcher, not a natural born hitter. End quote. So, although there is downplaying what comes directly after it, Ramirez hit, being hitless in his last 183 at bats, right? They're downplaying that, okay? uh, and that although is indicative of that. Okay? Same sort of thing. And then the next one, yes, she has a better GPA, but it's only 0.19 points higher. So that but is downplaying what preceded it, right? The fact that she has a better GPA. It's minimizing that, okay? trying to at least. So that is what we mean by downplayer. Minimizing something that's being said. Okay? Next we have stereotypes. You probably heard of you know, stereotype. Um, this is one that seems to be common. I mean, we've probably heard of most of these. Um, maybe you didn't know exactly what some of, some of these are, but, you know, stereotype, I feel like we've, most of us have come across this term. As I mentioned at the top of slide nine, this comes from page 147 of the text, quote, a stereotype is a cultural belief or idea about a social group's att attributes, usually simplified or exaggerated. It can be positive or negative, right? So a lot of times I think we have a tendency to think of stereotypes being negative, but they're, they can also be of the positive type, right? Um, and again, we want to to be wary of them either way, right? We don't wanna be positive, positively or negatively unduly swayed one way or another um, by the person using, employing stereotypes, okay? To try to get us to come to his or her side, right? Um, if, as the authors pointed out, if stereotypes are being relied on to convince us of something, you know, we better look out, right? And the, the gist behind a stereotype is that Right, it's it's a way of kind of painting a broad stroke. It's too too broad of a stroke, right? Um, with respect to characterizing a group. So maybe you know these particular ways of characterizing the group are true of like one or two or a few of the individuals in the group. But the idea is it's it's um, not indicative or um, there's not enough uh, evidence to support the idea that it's true of the whole group, right? And so again, we want to be on guard against people that use these stereotypes because they're suggesting something, right, that's stronger than it really is, right? Again, that's the whole idea behind stereotypes is the idea is that it's um, suggesting something's true of the whole group when in fact 
if anything, it's only true of a few members. Right? So as they point out, the authors did in the 10th edition, page 152 of that edition, quote, it's a generalization or an assumption about all the members of a group that is based on an image of those in the group. Okay? And maybe the image is true of one or two or a few of the individuals, like I said, and maybe it's not, right? But again, even if it is, that doesn't give us, or whoever is employing the, the stereotype, license to paint the entire group right, in such a way. Okay? And that's why stereotypes are problematic. And in general, as they point out in ninth edition, page 151, it oftentimes, quote, is a thought or image about a group of people based on little or no evidence, end quote. So I'll give you an example. All right, we all have this kind of stereotypical image of philosophers, maybe. So imagine someone saying, I don't even bother talking to philosophers since everyone knows that their heads are always up in the clouds. All right, they're just always lost in their own thoughts. And hey, that might be true of a few of us philosophers, sometimes maybe, but it's not necessarily true of all philosophers. Right? And just sort of use that kind of language, suggests that, right? And, or at least implies that. And that's why it can be problematic, right? And as critical thinkers, we want to, again, sort of have a detection, right? You know, be alarm. Uh, the alarm should be going off right, when we come across stereotypes. So let's put it that way. All right, so that's stereotypes. Next on our list or in our catalog is innuendo. So you've probably heard of the idea of innuendo before. And this rests on, you know, innuendos rest on kind of these natural assumptions we make. I think a lot of these do, right? They just rest on kind of what happens naturally for us, right? Um, things we don't even think about, like these kind of just natural processes, right? We kind of jump to certain things based on what's being said, right? We naturally come up with positive emotions given the euphemism and so on and so forth. And the idea is with an innuendo, the same sort of things going on, given our natural sort of the way we speak and our, our ways of conversing, we make these kinds of natural assumptions uh, in our everyday communication, right? It just happens all the time. And innuendos take advantage of that. So, right, um, if someone says something in a certain way, we're going to assume certain things about you know, what's being said, given how they're saying it. And some of those things we're assuming aren't necessarily always indicative of the truth. Okay? And I don't know if that, that came across very well, but some of these examples I think are, are really good and, and um, will help sort of help characterize what an innuendo really is. So again, it's taking advantage of this, the fact that we kind of naturally assume things in our everyday correspondence with people, right? So as they point out on page 148 of the text, well, innuendo uses the power of suggestion to disparage someone or something. Okay. Uh, the next quote there from page 155 of the 10th edition. So we're on slide 10 here. When an innuendo is employed, it allows one to get his or her, quote, point across without explicitly committing oneself to it, end quote. Again, it sounds a lot like, you know, Weaslers. Right? And a lot of these have a, a, lot of, a lot in common, right? And then the very last quote there from page 149 of our text, the 13th edition, quote, the key to recognizing innuendo is that it relies entirely on suggestion and implication rather than on wording that has overtly negative association. So that's how you can like, distinguish it from dysphemism, for example, right? It's relying on things that are just being assumed rather than, as they put it, the overtly negative associations of the wording itself. Okay? So again, examples um, will probably be helpful here. So top of slide 11, Imagine someone saying, and this is from the 10th edition, they, they actually, where is it in this edition? 148 of our 13th edition. They tweak the example. So I, uh, I quote the, the version they had from page 154 of the 10th edition. So imagine someone saying, ladies and gentlemen, I am proof that there is at least one candidate in this race who does not have a drinking problem, end quote. Okay, so now imagine, right, someone saying that. You're going to immediately assume that there is a candidate that does have a drinking problem. Otherwise, why are they saying this, right? And that's what we mean by innuendo, when we automatically assume certain things that aren't technically speaking being said, right? They're just being implied. That's innuendo, right? And the person uh, saying this, right? It's very powerful, and that's, off, that's why innuendos are so common, right? They, because they allow the person to sort of convey something much stronger than what they're actually technically committed to or saying. Okay. Uh, and so where was it? Um, their example in the 13th edition, 
pretty much the same thing, but this time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm proof that at least one candidate in this race doesn't make stuff up. Right. And that's from page, again, 148. So whether it's there's one candidate doesn't have a drinking problem, doesn't make stuff up, um, doesn't snore all throughout the night, um, doesn't pick his nose, whatever is being said, right, it's going to imply that there is a candidate who does that, right? Otherwise, why are they saying that? And why are they pointing this out? Okay, another example on the bottom of slide 11, he passed the exam this time. Okay, so this implies, we naturally assume, well, there must have been some times when he didn't pass the exam. Otherwise, why would you put it that way? But technically speaking, the person who said this didn't say they didn't pass, he didn't pass the exam, another exam, right? They implied it. Okay. Um, but he passed the exam this time, technically speaking, says the same thing as he passed the exam, right? It's not saying anything about whether or not he passed the exam any other time, even though, again, why would they say it this way unless they wanted to convey something a little stronger and suggest that he didn't pass it some other time? Right? But technically speaking, again, they, they didn't actually say that. They just implied it. So loaded question turning to slide 12 right? is related to innuendo. It's kind of innuendo if you want, right? Uh, and it's negative, okay? but it's distinct in its own right in the sense that it's in the form of a question, right? So it's still going to rest on you naturally making assumptions as we do in our everyday correspondence, okay? Um, but it's in the form of a question, and it's it's negative, right? So uh, as they point out on page 149 of our 13th edition, a loaded question, quote, rests on one or more unwarranted or unjustified assumptions. The classic example, which they reference on 149, have you stopped beating your wife? Okay. So this implies, right, that the person does beat their wife, but technically speaking, the person who asked this question didn't say that, right? They just implied that the person was beating their wife before, even though they didn't technically actually say it. So again, this implies, this is the bottom bullet point on slide 12. This implies that the person being questioned has in fact beaten his wife in the past, but as they point out in 149, quote, if there is no reason to think that this assumption is true, then the question is loaded, end quote. And, and as I was rereading through the chapter, I kind of, you know, basically my note here on the bottom of 149 is you could say some, anything in the form of question, right? Um, have you stopped picking your nose? Have you stopped cheating on the exams? Okay. And all of those are loaded questions, right? In the sense that they're letting you sort of suggest the person picks their nose or um, cheats on the exams without actually saying it, right? Um, and so again, if there's no reason to think, as they point out on the bottom, or on the bottom slide 12 from page 149, if there's no reason to think this assumption is true, then the question is loaded. So you can convey basically anything in a much stronger way by putting it in the form of a question and not have to defend it because, again, you haven't actually suggested they pick their nose or they cheat on the exams, right? You phrase it in the form of a question. Uh, have you stopped uh, cheating on the exam? Have you stopped picking your nose? You didn't actually say you did cheat on the exam or you did pick your nose before. Right? You're just implying it right, via your question. Okay, that was innuendo. Or sorry, that was a loaded question, which is related. It's a kind of type, if you will, of innuendo. Both of those, again, rest on how we automatically jump to certain conclusions or make certain assumptions based on what's being said. And it's natural, right? Otherwise, you know, why would they say he passed the exam this time if there weren't other times? But technically speaking, they haven't said he didn't pass the exam this other time. Right? But we're going to automatically assume that. And that's the, the nature of innuendos and loaded questions. Okay, hyperbole, or somebody being hyperbolic, you might have heard of this. Okay, It's basically just exaggeration to an extreme. Okay. So that's what I mentioned on the top of slide 13. When we say someone is being hyperbolic, it's just another way of saying that they're exaggerating you know, to an extreme. Okay. Um, so as the authors point out on page 151, hyperbole is extravagant overstatement or exaggeration. And then from the 10th edition, page 157, generally speaking, quote, it's when the colorfulness of language becomes excessive, of course, that's a matter of judgment, that the claim is likely to, to turn into hyperbole. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with being exaggerating, you know, especially for you know, entertainment purposes. It happens all the time. But as the authors point out, the whole point for us, right, is that we don't want to be unduly swayed by this kind of exaggeration or any of this sort of entertainment type stuff, right? 
um, you know, if somebody paints a, a extremely exaggerated picture of something, right? We again, we want to recognize that for what it is, uh, and and not be unduly swayed um, by the excessive nature of you know their communication. As in, this is another theme that the authors hammered home quite a bit throughout the the chapter that you will find a lot of these coupled together, you know, so where you find hyperbole, as I mentioned in the bottom of slide 13, oftentimes you'll find ridicule, right? So what is ridicule? Turn to slide 14, you know what ridicule is, right? It's just, so we all, you know, I have like this, we can all envision uh, a scenario where there's been like an argument or people have an exchange and the one person then just doesn't know how to kind of respond from a logical point of view or doesn't have a good argument so they just start making fun of right the other person I mean we've seen that probably right or we can at least envision that okay and again as critical thinkers we don't want to be persuaded by ridicule right so by the way ridicule equals sarcasm equals what's known as horse horse laugh sometimes right we don't want to um, again there's nothing necessarily wrong per se with ridicule being involved, I mean, it's I, I tend to think of, usually think of it negatively, but from a logician's perspective, it doesn't mean that what's being said, right? That there's not necessarily a good argument underneath it all. Okay, but again, we want to, you know, not be persuaded by putting people down or you know making jokes at people's expenses, right? We don't want to just jump on board because everyone else is laughing, right? We want to actually again, focus on. The arguments, if there are any that are at play, right, and set aside the jokes, the ridicule, etc. As mentioned, this is the second bullet, the quote. So this is slide 14, quoting page 150 of the 13th edition. As you can probably guess, quote: This device includes ridicule and vicious humor of all kinds. And then the, the next quote, then the general idea is that quote: Critical thinkers should be able to see the difference between argumentation on one hand and entertainment on the other. Page 151, and again, that is a theme that they, they kind of developed throughout the chapter. And one commits a fallacy if he or she uses, quote, ridicule rather than legitimate argument for the purpose of rebuttal. All right, so page, that's from page 486, actually. And so, um, right, imagine, again, the person that couldn't come up with an argument, right, and so they then use ridicule, like start making fun of the other person. And right? if they think that they're actually, right, um, rejecting them and undermining what that person's saying from a log logistics perspective, a, a logical perspective, they're committing a fallacy, right? They're not actually in ridicule the other person. They're not actually rebutting what they're saying from a logical perspective. Right? They haven't touched um, what the person's saying from a logical perspective, right? They have to address the points or the arguments in and of themselves, right? Whether or not they're uh, ridiculing the person in the process, right? That has no bearing on whether or not they've actually rebutted the arguments themselves that the person has said. Hopefully that made some sense, but I was trying to explain the very last part there. One commits a fallacy if he or she uses ridicule rather than legitimate argument for the purpose of rebuttal. Um, so, I mean, a lot of times the person who responds with ridicule, right, when they don't have anything better to say, they don't actually have an argument, they, they know that, right? So it wouldn't necessarily be a mistake on their part. They just have no other recourse, right, to try to, to win, so to speak, to try to get everyone persuaded on their side. Right, they know they don't have any good arguments, so they then right, take recourse on ridicule and try to make fun of the other person instead in a, a, a way, as a way to then win people over still to their side. Right? So, again, that's the bottom of slide 14. That was ridicule. Next, we have rhetorical definitions, explanations. Analogies, we'll cover these in the next couple of slides here. And then I would throw in there, they didn't mention questions, right? We've heard rhetorical, is that a rhetorical question? When someone asks us a rhetorical question, they don't want us to actually respond, right? They're only asking the question to conjure up certain feelings or emotions, right? Um, to sort of make a point right? and to, in a sense, persuade us, right? Um, it's a persuasive technique, not an actual sort of method to try to you know communicate right they're not actually trying to get an answer from us when they offer us a rhetorical question so i thought i'd throw that in there too right um just like we have rhetorical definitions explanations analogies but we also have rhetorical questions and it's exact, it works the same exact way so top of slide 15 recall that we already discussed rhetorical definitions in lecture seven 
which corresponds to chapter three in the textbook. So, right, what is a rhetorical definition? It uses, as I mentioned in the next bullet there, quoting page 152, it uses, quote, rhetorically charged language to express or elicit an attitude about something, end quote. So, again, the person that's offering a rhetorical definition, they're not just trying to convey what a word means in its average everyday sense, right? They're trying to um, persuade us, right, to, to conjure up certain emotions and feelings, okay? There's, there's an intent to influence us. Right? It's not just informative, right? as most usual every, everyday definitions would be. So an example, classic example, page 152, middle of uh, slide 15, defining abortion as the murder of an unborn child, end quote, right? That would qualify as a rhetorical definition. It's going to conjure up certain, you know, very negative emotion. Murder. Second we hear murder, right? Negative, right? So that sort of same analysis then applies for rhetorical explanations. The same sort of thing is going on. The person who's offering a rhetorical explanation isn't trying to just, you know, convey useful a useful explanation. Right? They are trying to persuade us in the process, right? To influence us in the process. Um, so whenever somebody's offering a rhetorical explanation, it's going to be conjuring up all kinds of emotions in the process. Um, so it works very similar then to the definition, except in this case you're dealing with an explanation not a definition, right? and an analogy works pretty much the same exact way as well. Right? Rather than just offering an analogy to try to convey useful information, again, the person offering a rhetorical analogy is trying to persuade us, to influence us to think a certain way or believe or behave a certain way. So top of slide 16, re referencing a rhetorical analogy. Okay? This is from page 153 of the text. A rhetorical analogy, quote, Likens two or more things to make one of them appear better or worse than another, end quote. So my example, Sue Ellen is dumb as a brick. Right? Um, so unlike your the bottom bullet point there, unlike your average everyday analogy, in which we're just trying to convey you know, useful information, as I put it earlier, or we're just trying to enlighten someone about something in a kind of straightforward way, rhetorical analogies, they're trying to persuade us in the process, right? So um, in oftentimes are couched in very extreme ways. Okay. And I'm sure we're fairly familiar with rhetorical analogies. We've seen them. Um, okay, so that was slide 16. Moving right along in our catalog here, we hit all those here. We'll talk about proof surrogates. These are very common, and again, as critical thinkers, all these you want to be on guard against. Another one where you'll run into these all the time and uh, hopefully after this class, right, you'll, you'll start recognizing them more and more. I know that when I started teaching this, um, going through some of this stuff, I, I really, you really do start picking up on it more and more. And you recognize how common these kinds of things really are, right? So you read an article, for example, um, let's say um, one of the, uh, I'm not going to name any particular media sites, but on a particular media site, you read an article, you know, I would say almost 50% of the time you're going to run into one of these proof surrogates where they'll say things like this okay so what is a proof surrogate we'll start off with that top of slide 17 coming from page 157 of the 13th edition a proof surrogate quote suggests there is evidence or authority for a claim without actually citing such evidence or authority end quote so we can announce from page 157 so classic examples informed sources say or one that I, as we all know right as we all know, well, that's not actually citing evidence, right? It's suggesting there's evidence or that it's patently obvious, but it's not pointing out why it should be, right? It's not actually citing a reason or evidence. Informed sources say, well, just saying that doesn't actually give us proof, right? What is it they're saying? And who are the informed sources? Another example, as most people know, okay, well, you haven't actually given us evidence. You're just suggesting that it's commonly known. Right? That may or may not be the case in and of itself, right? We don't know. All the person's doing is giving us a surrogate, right? It's not actual evidence. It's just given under the guise of actual evidence, right? It's given in lieu of actual evidence. Okay, so very, very common when the person sort of conveys something as if it's clear there's evidence, right? And they say something in such a fashion to suggest it, you know, it's obvious, right? Um, but then don't actually give evidence or the reasons. That's a proof surrogate. They need to give the proof itself, right? Not just the surrogate. 
Okay. Finally, we have what's known as repetition. This is a very interesting one to me because it just baffles my mind. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's so true propaganda. This is how propaganda works. You know, you just repeat something often enough. It doesn't matter how ludicrous or crazy it is. Um, it will make an imprint on people's minds and they will start to believe it. That's how advertising works, too. Why advertising is, is, advertising is so effective. Right? We all think we're consciously aware that there's no way this advertising can influence us. Right, but you see a brand name or a brand, a brand image or a slogan often enough, and it just it it makes an imprint on what psychologists might say that the subconscious, right? Um, whether you're consciously aware of it or not. And again, that's how advertising works. It's, you know, even on critical thinkers, you know, like our like our, ourselves, who try to be aware of this sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, again, there's certain techniques and devices that still seem to to work right and again so as critical thinkers we just try to do the best we can when you see something repeated constantly again be on guard there's probably um uh, a motive behind that right and it is an effective technique so as i mentioned on the top of slide 18 i like how they quoted vladimir lenin on page 157 of the text he speaks to the power of repetition he said quote a lie told often enough becomes the truth right? so again as i mentioned Simple repetition, think, you know, an advertise, um, so a corporation, right? And they all have their brand images, right? That's why that stuff's so effective, right? So for whatever reason, as the authors point out on page 158 of the text, the constant, this is a quote, the constant repetition of a theme seems eventually to have a dulling effect on our critical faculties. And we become lulled into believing something simply because we become used to hearing it, end quote. That is honestly a little bit scary to me. That just hearing something enough, even if we patently don't believe it, you know, at first, um, just hearing it enough can end up doling us, as they say, and lulling us into this then, and then into us ending up believing it nonetheless. Um, yeah, that, that seems a bit scary to me, but there is something behind this idea of repetition. You know, again, that's how propaganda has worked in the past. That's how or why advertising campaigns are so successful, in part at least. Right? So as critical thinkers, we want to do the best job we can to recognize repetition whenever we see it. Right? Okay, so some concluding notes turning to slide 19. Um, I already mentioned this earlier, but we'll just reiterate, right, where you see one of these, you can oftentimes see another. They're oftentimes intertwined. That'll hold true as well when we discuss fallacies in the next section. Oftentimes, where you'll see one fallacy, you 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 know you might see it intertwined with another fallacy. Okay, so you know you might identify something as the a euphemism, and then also you know there's a downplay involved. Okay, so classic combination: hyperbole and ridicule, oftentimes linked together. Also, wanted to mention they they talked a little bit about like um, imagery at the end of the chapter. Okay, so and this is actually from the tenth edition. The middle of slide 19, I quote page 167 of the 10th edition, they, they wrote in the 10th edition, quote, photos, videos, and other imagery technically cannot be true or false, but claims based on such imagery are true or false, end quote. So the point here and what they're getting at the end of the chapter when they talk about, um, where was that? Yeah, 161, when they talk about persuasion through imagery, right, is that as critical thinkers, we need to be cognizant of the fact that humans are influenced by imagery um, and believe and behave accordingly, right? Due to that influence, okay? And they pointed out how oftentimes images are actually more influential and persuasive than arguments, right? And again, why advertising oftentimes relies on certain images, right? Rather than conveying good arguments, right? Um, so again, we wanna be on guard, right? And remember as critical thinkers that you know, these images, these emotions that are being conjured up due to this image, we have to set that aside, right, and not be unduly, again, influenced from a logical perspective, right, and convinced in a logical sense based on the emotions that are conjured up from an image. Again, an image, right, a picture, a movie, none of that can be true or false, okay? Um, it can't really be assessed from, in that sense from a logical perspective. Now, because it's not propositional, as the authors pointed out, right, it's not something that can be true or false. 
right? A theme in a movie, that can't be true or false either, right? And it's a, a sports movie, okay? Not something that can be true or false, okay? The emotions, again, that are conjured up, not something that's true or false. Only claims, right? Propositions are things that can be true or false. Those are the kinds of things we can analyze right, from a, a logical perspective. Okay? And so, again, part of our job as logicians and critical thinkers uh, is to focus on this and alternatively set aside everything else, okay? uh, including, point here is, including all, any emotions, feelings that might be conjured up from pictures, okay? images, right? has no bearing on the arguments at play or what's being said from a, what's being said or not said from a logical perspective. Right? And they also pointed out, as I mentioned at the very bottom, this sort of stuff, this visual media, it can be manipulated more and more, right? With the capacity or the ability to manipulate this sort of stuff, right? Almost everyone has it now. So another reason why we need to be especially on guard when it comes to it, right? Because people with an agenda can very easily manipulate, right? This kind of media with this imagery. And then if we're not on guard, right? If we don't have our critical thinking cap on, we can be then unduly swayed by these, these kinds of images which have been manipulated. Okay, so hopefully a lot of this is resonating with you now, right? The, the general theme, so concluding now, the general theme, right, is um, kind of, I think the general theme here is that as critical thinkers, there's a lot of stuff we have to kind of set aside, right? It's not necessarily negative, right? It doesn't mean that, hey, what they're saying from a logical perspective is bad, right? But Oftentimes we will, or people have a tendency to be influenced though unduly, and that's what we want to be cognizant of, right? And be especially aware of and be sure that is not that's not happening with respect to us, right? So not necessarily bad, but it's not good either, right? And we don't want to, um, again, I feel like I say unduly like 500 times um, each lecture, but we don't want to be unduly swayed then by, uh, or swayed at all really by, uh, any of these, right, these techniques. Okay, so I guess that in general is the overarching theme throughout the election, right, when it comes to this rhetoric, this emotional stuff. Throw it aside, toss it aside, right? It's not bad per se, but it's not good either from a lo uh, logician's perspective. Get it to the side and analyze the meat, right, what really matters from the logician's perspective, the arguments, if any, right, that are at play. Right? The information that's there, if any. That's what the logician or critical thinker is concerned with. So I think that's it. Uh, that's all we have to say here in lecture nine with respect to rhetoric. Again, I have a very important lecture, I feel like. Um, you know, not anything too complicated I, in my mind, but very important in the sense that, again, these are all things that we, run, we come across all the time. Okay, so um, we, again, something that we need to really be cognizant of as critical thinkers then, be able to identify these and in some sense sort of set them aside when we're perceiving as logicians. Okay. So that was lecture nine, what we're going to say on rhetoric. That concludes then our uh, section three of the course where we talk about a lot of important related issues, clarity, credibility, rhetoric, a lot of uh, issues for the, the logician or critical thinker. They don't have to do with arguments per se, right? Um, but that we need to be sort of aware of um, nonetheless. And so having concluded now section three, we will turn our attention in the final section, section four of the course, to fallacies, mistakes in reasoning. So as I intimated earlier, none of these are necessarily indicative of mistakes, okay? The person might consciously be employing them, right, and, and purposely be employing them for the sake of being more persuasive, right? They're not necessarily indicative of um, logical mistakes. Fallacies are, right? There's some sort of mistake being made. Okay? Um, and so lectures 10, 11, and 12 will go through different kinds of fallacies. And it'll be very similar. Those lectures will be very similar in the sense that we'll have kind of catalogs of fallacies that we'll go through and we'll say which, you know, uh, so, so in other words, um, types of um, mistakes in reasoning are so common that logicians have names for them, right? Um, so this type of mistake we'll call a false dilemma, right? So what we'll do is we'll go through, just like we did here, we'll go through all these different types of mistakes or fallacies, false dilemma, straw man, et cetera. We'll go through all of them. 
in much the same fashion as we did here in Lecture 9. Uh, but again, in Lectures 10, 11, and 12, we'll be cataloging these various fallacies. So that is what we have to look forward to. Again, I hope you uh, enjoyed or at least feel like you learned something from our discussion of rhetoric. So this has been Lecture 9, which corresponds to Chapter 5 of the textbook if you're taking the course. Next time I see you, it'll be for Lecture 10 of Section 4, where we'll talk, we'll begin our discussion of fallacies with relevance fallacies. Thank you.